No pressure. I keep saying you, but we've got some good things going. Greetings, everybody. Uh, welcome to the inaugural Book Talk and Dialogue for the Bank Center for Educational Justice. Um, I am really pleased to see this room so packed. Um, and uh, I'm Django Paris, director of the Bank Center for Educational Justice. And again, really grateful that you're here to hear this, uh, to, to witness this first event uh, featuring Dr. Joy Williamson Lott in dialogue with Dr. Michelle Purdy. I also wanted to uh, uh, say hello to all the folks that uh, are tuning in on the uh, College of Education YouTube uh, site, so thank you so much. And please follow us also at UW Ed Justice. That's at UW Ed Justice. Uh, Jasmine Moore will be live tweeting the event. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the University of Washington, like all of our lives, and our institution exists on indigenous land. We gather on the shared homelands of the Duwamish and the Suquamish peoples, and peoples from the Tulalip and Muckleshoot tribes and other Coast Salish peoples, and I'm grateful to be here. I hope you are as well. Such land acknowledgments should be rooted in ongoing relationships about doing the work with the people of, and the land in a good way. The center will work to uphold this responsibility in our inaugural year and across the years to come. Whether at our gathering on native teacher education that is gonna happen uh, on May 2nd and 3rd, or our summer graduate course taught by the eminent scholar of indigenous education, Sandy Grande. Today we focus on what Joy Williamson Lott calls the black freedom struggle in education. And I wanna make explicit as well the center's commitment to black educational justice and also to the inextricable link between black people and native people here on T Turtle Island. As Dakota organizer and activist Tanya Black Elk puts it, these are stolen lands built by stolen hands. I'd like to mention a few very special guests that we have with us. Uh, James and Cherry Banks, whose extraordinary legacy the Bank Center for Educational Justice honors are right here. So if we could please acknowledge them. Uh, thank you, Jim and Cherry, for all you do and continue to do. We appreciate you so much. I'd also like to acknowledge our Dean, Mia Tuan, as well as our co-sponsors for this event, the Center for Communication, Difference, and Equity, directed by Relina Joseph, and the Department of American Ethnic Studies, uh, chaired by Juan Guerra, who's also with us today. I also want to acknowledge the work of Jasmine Moore, our research assistant, as well as Kent Jewell and Justine Zen. Uh, really wonderful work to help put this together. So Michelle Purdy will uh, formally introduce Joy, but if I could just share that uh, Joy Williamson Lott has everything to do with, uh, with my love of educational history, as well as with uh, my understanding of the importance in educational history um, in the work we do for educational justice. Joy was an early career assistant professor at Stanford when I was a graduate student there. Um, and as a doctoral student, I took both her courses, uh, the History of African American Education, as well as Education for Liberation. And so those were wonderful classes, and I'm so grateful to be your colleague now, Joy, so thank you. <laughs> Anybody who's taken her classes is ready to give a hand to that. Um, and I know we have some of her current students uh, here now. So I now um, like to introduce Dr. Michelle Purdy. Dr. Michelle Purdy is an assistant professor of education Director of Undergraduate Educational Studies and an affiliate faculty member in the Interdisciplinary Program in Urban Studies and the Center on Urban Research and Public Policy at Washington University in St. Louis. Just last month, Michelle published this wonderful new book, <laughs> Transforming the Elite. And so if you haven't checked it out, please do. The book analyzes how and why historically white private schools open their doors and opted to desegregate when not legally obligated to do so. It's really a crucial story of de desegregation that hasn't been told, and particularly in the way that Michelle tells it. As Michelle mentioned to me recently when we were, dis when we were talking about her book, the book uh, with a book and a movie like The Hate You Give, 
Centering a black character who attends an elite private school, knowing this history is crucial to understand the present for black students in private schools and far beyond. So I'm so thrilled that Dr. Purdy is here for this inaugural event. We were professors at Michigan State for two years and uh, where we became academic family and Michelle is truly Ray Paris and my uh, sister in this work and this life and I'm so grateful that she got on that plane from St. Louis and came out here to join us. And what is a really busy time, her book literally came out like three weeks ago, so um, the fact that she came out, I'm, I'm really happy about. So I'm really grateful to have these two brilliant historians of education join us today for this inaugural event. I'm particularly grateful to have two brilliant black women educational historians with us here today. If you didn't already know, black women along with indigenous women have always led and continue to lead positive social change across academia as they do across politics, across social mm -hmm. movements, and across our lives and communities. So Michelle will now introduce Joy. Joy will offer a brief book talk, and then Joy and Michelle will engage in a dynamic dialogue about the role of educational justice and educational history in that work. And so thank you very much for being here, and I'm pleased to give the stage to Dr. Michelle Purdy. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm going to try that again. I'm from Jackson, Mississippi. <laughs> so we're going, to, we're going to try that one more time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. There we go. What an honor to be here today. First, a major thank you to Django Paris, my brother and academic brother and chosen kin. This time seven years ago, I had been an assistant professor for just two and a half months. The transition from being a graduate student at Emory University in Atlanta to being a faculty member at Michigan State University in East Lansing, Michigan, have been made smoother because of Django and Ray Paris. We, along with Terry Flanagan and Joy Hannibal, who also came to state in 2011, quickly became respected colleagues committed to the pursuit of educational justice and equity, and also friends. I will be forever grateful for gaining an academic brother in Django, or DP as I like to call him, and a friend who has mutual love for basketball, tennis, culture, and very good food. It is, is a true privilege to be here to congratulate him in person on becoming the inaugural James A. and Sherry A. Banks Professor of Multicultural Education, to see that medal in his office, <laughs> and to help him launch the director, his directorship of the Banks Center for Educational Justice Center at the University of Washington. As Django and I became respected colleagues and friends, we also discovered that we had another commonality. We had both been students of Professor Joy Ann Williamson Lott. I at Washington University in St. Louis and Django at Stanford, as he mentioned. We both commented on her fierce scholarship and teaching that pushed us to think critically about history and the long struggle for black liberation. Today, as you know, Joy is a full professor here at the University of Washington with program affiliations in both equity studies and social and cultural foundations. She has served in numerous administrative roles here at the University of Washington and is currently the co-editor of History of Education Quarterly, the leading publication in our field. Yet when I first met her, she was just beginning her career. She was completing a postdoctoral fellowship at WashU. I was an undergrad then, still deciding what I, what I wanted to major in, but it was becoming clear that educational studies and African-American studies were probably going to be my majors. Plus, I was becoming more intrigued about the study of African-American educational history as I read James Anderson's The Education of Blacks in the South and Vanessa Siddle Walker's Their Highest Potential. Thankfully, after graduating from the University of Illinois, Joy came to us at WashU. And you see, she was a lifer at Illinois. She had completed her undergrad and master's degrees and was mentored by James Anderson in her doctoral program. So we were really excited as black students when we had this new postdoc come to us. Um, and luckily for me, I was able to take multicultural education with her. Kind of just full circle today, right? Joy introduced us to the leading scholarship in the field, provided us with the history of multicultural education and its necessity in the pursuit of educational justice so that children can bring their whole selves to school and so that administrators and teachers could welcome whole children and advance a curriculum that pushes against the status quo and dominant narratives. Over the years, Joy and I remained in touch and sure enough, my teacher became one of my mentors in the field of educational history. 
As I learned from my doctoral advisor, Vanessa Siddle Walker, mentors take the time. And my goodness, Joy has certainly taken the time with me and with many others. She readily agrees to meet with me at conferences to discuss my work and my progress. She has given me substantive feedback on my work. She has been a mentor many times in our Division F mentoring seminars at AERA. And she has been a discussant for my sessions at the History of Education Society and also at ARA. She takes the time to ask how I'm doing personally, to share, to listen, and to advise. From 2015 to 2017, she served as Vice President of Division F, which is the History and Historiography Division of AERA. And during her time as our VP, we enjoyed many engaging intellectual sessions, had important discussions about our field, and shared in much camaraderie. I have learned from Joy's thought-provoking research and teaching for a number of years now. She is a rigorous scholar, taking up new ground in the history of higher ed and African-American educational history. In her first book, Black Power on Campus, the University of Illinois from 1965 to 75, she interrogates the interaction between students and administrators that created the successful support systems that actually currently exist at University of Illinois today. She then took us from the Midwest to the Deep South in radicalizing the Ebony Tower, black colleges, and the black freedom struggle in Mississippi, in which she examines issues of institutional autonomy, institutional response to internal and external pressures, and the relationship between historically black colleges and the civil rights and black power movements. Her most recent book, Jim Crow Campus, which she will tell us more about today, investigates academic freedom and her continued focus on student activism as Southern higher education institutions, both black and white, both public and private, shifted from local and regional to national institutions against the backdrop of the civil rights movement and anti-war activism. Through her work, she problematizes existing historiography on higher education, African-American education, faculty and, student, and faculty and student lives. And she pushes us all to consider how we're defining the function and form of institutions, how students are centered, and how activism comes in many forms. We are gathered here today to celebrate and honor her many contributions to advancing our historical and contemporary understanding of educational justice and how she lives out such work as a scholar, a teacher, a mentor, advisor, editor, and professional leader. Moreover, Joy provides a personal example that I know many of us also admire through her loving partnership with Joe, who is here, right over here, opportunity. And I thank Joy for being herself, for being all that, for all that she does, and for all that she will continue to do. So we now welcome to the podium Professor Joy Ann Williamson Lott <laughs> to tell us more about Jim Crow Campus. I have, I have never had an introduction like that before, ever. I want to watch the live stream myself. Uh, that was amazing. Uh, I did teach both of these outstanding intellectuals. I'm only moderately old. I was a baby when I started. Uh, and it has been such a pleasure to continue to cross paths with the both of you and to watch you grow from an undergraduate student through graduate school as a graduate student and on to the inaugural uh, directorship of the Bank Center for Educational Justice. It has just been a pleasure and a joy to be connected to you too. So thank you for this, for this honor and I'm so glad to be here in dialogue, in dialogue with you, Michelle. You. Okay, so. I've been thinking a lot about academic freedom and freedom of speech lately, not just because I spent the last few years writing a book on it, but because of our national context. Mm -hmm. It feels as if we need to guard our constitutional rights in a way that um, we should all take very seriously. The fact that I've been writing a book about academic freedom and freedom of speech was quite serendipitous. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm usually not told that I need a mic. So this is new. Uh, um, so what I do in the book, Jim Crow Campus, is it's an analysis of how powerful external forces like the black freedom struggle, the anti-Vietnam War movement, and the knowledge economy, which I'll uh, explain in a little bit, how those powerful external forces dovetailed with powerful internal forces, particularly faculty and student activism, to undermine the traditional role of higher educational institutions in the South. 
which was basically to fortify and justify the racial hierarchy. And so how the battles between constituents with different levels of power, like students and faculty, uh, trustees and administrators, how those battles help to recreate and reform these institutions into reputable academic centers, which then were supposed to be bastions of academic freedom for mm -hmm. faculty and freedom of speech for students. So I just want to talk a little bit about the knowledge economy because it's incredibly important in why and how uh, institutions of higher education um, shifted in the South. I'm just going to assume when I say the black freedom struggle and the anti-Vietnam War movement, you know what I'm talking about, so I'm just going to focus on <laughs> knowledge economy. So one of our own um, history professors here at the UW, uh, Margaret Pugh O'Mara, talks about what she calls cities of knowledge. And these are um, places that became engines of scientific and technological production that could pump millions of dollars into local communities. And so institutions of higher education were key because it's a knowledge economy based on scientific and technological innovation rather than an agricultural economy or Mississippi's in Oxford and both um, Florida A&M University, which is a black institution, and uh, Florida, the predominantly white institution, are in Tallahassee. And so what happens is you have, um, you, when you have an, an institution that can participate in the knowledge economy, like I said, uh, federal dollars flow there. And they need the federal dollars because state legislatures were loath to fund higher education. Kind of like now, like I said, it's like deja vu all over mm -hmm. again. Uh, and so these institutions that wanted to upgrade needed federal dollars. They wanted to be able to hire the best faculty, not just people from the state. They, those faculty wanted to be able to educate graduate students, so they needed to create graduate programs. They needed to upgrade their facilities, their libraries, their laboratories, and all of that needed federal money. But there are strings attached to federal money, like the Constitution, especially the, 14th, the First and Fourteenth Amendments. And so the, uh, you had Southern trustees who had to decide whether they were going to accept the federal money make some changes <laughs> and upgrade, or forego the money and stay in the good graces of local white obstructionists. And so this is a battle that's happening throughout the South during the time. Like I said, the knowledge economy is an important piece of this puzzle. So what I do in the book and what I'm going to do today is talk through some examples. I'm going to talk to you about some examples of uh, particular institutions in different places and at different times to chart, uh, I, what I looked for in the book um, are, were patterns about how race and place influenced how institutions wrestled with academic freedom. So for today's purpose, I'm actually going to just focus on the black freedom struggle, race and place, rather than the anti-Vietnam War movement. And I'm also going to focus on um, faculty and academic freedom and not student First Amendment rights. But if you buy the book, you can learn about all of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so first I'm going to take you back to Alabama, 1957. Um, Auburn University used to be called Alabama Polytechnic University. That's what it was called in 1957. So you have to understand the national context or the local context. Alabama in 1957. Again, if you know anything about American history, you can somewhat picture it, right? The Brown decision had only recently been decided. Alabama had refused to desegregate any of its schools, much less any of its other public facilities. The Montgomery bus boycott had been brought to a close only after federal intervention and after a year. And the University of Alabama was very temporarily, briefly desegregated. And so my point is that the black freedom struggle was intense in Alabama in 1957. You need to understand that to understand the context of what happened. So there's a professor there. Auburn's white, all white at that time. Mostly white now, all white then. <laughs> uh, there's a professor, Bud Hutchinson, who writes uh, a letter that gets published in, published in the student newspaper, The Plainsman. And in his letter, he writes, what is difficult to understand is the reasoning of those persons who profess decency, a feeling for their fellow man, and who boast of their moral standards, yet who nevertheless hesitate to join in the crusade to drive ignorance, poverty, and social injustice from our midst. So it might sound tepid, but it's 1957 Alabama. So the trustees initiate his firing. Not the president, not a faculty committee, the trustees. 
So the, the AAUP, the American Association of University Professors, gets involved. He asks for help from the national office. He also, the, Bud Hutchinson does. He also asks for help from the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, which is an accreditation body. All institutions of higher education are overseen, in a way, by accrediting bodies. They're incredibly important. So Hutchinson asks for help from the AAUP and SACS, Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. That's SACS for short. And um, the president and the trustees write back in explaining why Bud Hutchinson should remain unemployed, uh, at least at Auburn. And so in the letter that the president writes to the AAUP, he tells the AAUP, look, when he came and interviewed, his department chair told him not to talk about segregation or desegregation. And then this is a quote from the letter. Uh, that what he said that Hutchinson's letter did not quote did not reflect favorably upon Southerners who favor segregation of the races in public institutions of higher education. He shouldn't have done that. It is offending the local which would be done in areas of the state that they represent unless positive action were taken. So the positive action is the firing of Bud Hutchinson. Mm. So they say if we didn't fire him, there would have been backlash from white citizens in the state. Therefore, his firing was justified. So there's no academic freedom in there, mm -hmm. right? So that's Alabama in 1957. Jump forward in time a little bit to Mississippi and further west. Uh, if the movement was hot and heavy in Alabama in 1957, you can imagine what it's like in Mississippi in the early 1960s. I say this to some of the students who have taken my classes, remember this, I'll quote Nina Simone, Mississippi, God damn. <laughs> that's from a song. Uh, Nina Simone. So uh, the, the movement was incredibly intense in Mississippi in the early 1960s. Uh, so 1962, the same year that James Meredith desegregated the University of Mississippi, was the first black person to attend that institution, that same year uh, the trustees at the University of Mississippi, I'm going to be talking about the University of Mississippi and then eventually Mississippi Valley State, both public. Ole Miss is white, Mississippi Valley is black. So the trustees develop a tenure policy that says a tenured faculty member can only be fired after a hearing in front of his or her peers. And they do this in 1962 because the AAUP and SACS said to the University of Mississippi, you need to come up with some kinds of policies that will prevent political interference at your institution because the governor had declared himself the registrar of the university to prevent James Meredith's enrollment. So he says, you know what? I'm the registrar. I'm going to deny him um, admission. And so trust, uh, the AAUP and SAC say to trustees, look, you need to get this under control. <laughs> you need to come up with some policies that protect your faculty. So they devised this policy in 1962. In 1963, James Silver, who's a tenured full professor of history, writes a book called Mississippi the Closed Society. And he excoriates um, white segregationists, these white supremacists in the book. I have a quote. This is, this is somewhat tepid, but again, it's radical in the context. So he writes in the book, the Mississippian who prides himself on individuality in reality lives in a climate where nonconformity is forbidden, where the white man is not free, where he does not dare to, to express deviating opinions without looking over his shoulder. So mm -hmm. here, it's the state legislators who demand that Silver is fired. It's not even the trustees or the president. Now it's the state legislators that say, fire James Silver. And a state representative who would become the governor, uh, this is a quote from him, accreditation or no accreditation, the time has come to fumigate some of our college staffs and get those who will teach Americanism and not foreign ideologies. And what he means by this is that at the time, communism and the black freedom struggle were, it, in the white supremacist mind, were linked. And so both sought to undermine American democracy. And so when he's talking about foreign ideologies, he's linking the black freedom struggle and communism. Um, Silver pursues the case, but it's eventually dropped when he takes a uh, position at Notre Dame. So that's 1963. Remember that tenure policy had been adopted in 1962. 1964, over at Mississippi Valley State, um, the this, which is a black institution, 
but all the trustees were white. Mississippi has one consolidated board of trustees for all of its institutions, black or white. And I feel very safe in saying that each and every one of them was racist. I don't use the term a lot, but I'm going to use it now. Every one of them was racist in the early 1960s. I have a, there's a quote in the book. There's a, um, a trustee who, in the 1970s, he says, every time I read the definition of a racist, I say, yeah, that's me. I'm a racist, and I don't apologize for it. That's 1970. I mean, he said, it's amazing to me what people will say and write down. <laughs> Thank God for my purposes, for archival purposes. Um, but same trustees. So the president fires several black faculty and lists contumacious conduct, which is rebellious conduct, as the reason for their firing. And so these were not, these faculty were not activists. What they were were members of their local AAUP chapter which signals a desire for autonomy and control over your academic life. That's what the AAUP is supposed to be able to help professors do. So they're members of the AAUP. They disagree with the contumacious conduct charge, contact the National Office of the AAUP and ask for help. The National Office sends down investigators, as this still happens today, like if there's a, if, uh, you, know, you can call the National Office and if there's enough evidence, they'll come in and do an investigation. So that's what happens at Mississippi Valley State. And the um, AAUP agrees with the professors that it was their um, membership in the AAUP, which I actually think he, the president meant by contumacious conduct, like they had the audacity to be members of the AAUP. So the, um, the AAUP in their report warns the trustees and the president that they're putting the institution in jeopardy. And this is a quote. If the administrators are permitted to flout the regulations which affect themselves, is not the reaction among faculty members and students likely to be one of cynical disregard, if not contempt, for an authority which expects more of them than it does of themselves? So why should anybody follow any rules? If you created this 10-year rule two years ago, people haven't even had time to forget, and you're violating it. So the trustees respond and um, attempt to justify the president's actions. Uh, and one response uh, goes, the Board of Trustees has not authorized these violations, but has come to the conclusion that the welfare of these institutions, talking about black institutions, and the students involved require that the actions of the president should be sustained in these instances. So they say, we didn't tell him to do it, but we like that he did it. <laughs> uh, and then the AUP investigator, in um, writing up his notes about the meeting, um, talking about the same uh, board member, says that, and this is a quote you see here, that the situation at the Negro colleges in Mississippi was very different than the situation in the white colleges. He said, and he's talking about the board member, that if early notice was given, the new militant spirit among the Negroes would be likely to arouse the students to rebellion, and late notice was therefore a safeguard against, against such student action. So they fired the faculty members without due process and in violation of the tenure policy to stop any possibility of student activism. Get them off the campus as fast as you can so the students can't get aroused. It's 1964 Mississippi. So this is how the board justifies its actions. So that's public institutions. I also want to talk a little bit about private institutions. Elite private white institutions like Duke or Emory or Vanderbilt struck whites only language from their charters and their admissions procedures in the early 1960s. This is an example from Duke. But it wasn't because they were particularly racially liberal. It's because they wanted to become regional and national powerhouses. And they needed the federal funds. They're private. Their philanthropic, the, the access that they have isn't enough for them to become the powerhouses that they want to become. They need the federal money. Think about, you know, they, these, they relied even then on federal money. So it's, that's why these elite institutions move more quickly than others, because of the national reputation they were trying to get. But you also have smaller white private institutions, many of them religiously affiliated, who also want to be able to upgrade, not necessarily have a, a national footprint, but be able to upgrade. They also need the federal dollars, but remember they're religious institutions, which also means they're tied to their denominations in a way that these bigger elite institutions never would be. 
So here I'm going to talk about Mercer University in the early 1960s. Mercer is a small Baptist institu white Baptist institution in Georgia. So it's tied to the Georgia Baptist Convention. So when the Georgia Baptist Convention passes a resolution against desegregation, there's nothing Mercer University could do about it. They're tied to the domination. I don't think they really wanted to do anything about it, but even if they had, they couldn't have. That gets a little bit challenged when this student who's from Ghana applies to enroll. What had happened was these Baptist missionaries went over to Ghana, converted to him, and he says, I love being a Baptist. I am a Baptist. I want to go to Mercer, get my degree so I could go back to Ghana and spread the gospel. So it's not about desegregation. It's not about African American rights in the U.S. It's about um, being, basically becoming a missionary, a better missionary, by getting a bachelor's degree. So what do you do? <laughs> You're the one who converted them. <laughs> uh, and so the Georgia Baptist Convention relents. But it's not, I don't want you to think against this kind of moral dilemma. They wanted that money, and that's where this quote comes from. That Christian institutions must remain competitive with secular institutions of both academics and spirituality. It's that being able to compete academically they needed the federal money. So that's how changes started to happen at this small private institution. So jumping forward in time and over to South Carolina, Voorhees College is a private black uh, institution in Denmark, South Carolina, affiliated with the Protestant Episcopal Church. So it's, it's a church-affiliated institution. It has a racially mixed board of trustees but the chairperson is a white man, a white Episcopal minister. So this is still, it's a private black institution. There's still a lot of white power happening at black, not all black institutions, but at many. So students there in 1967 organized, it's called the Black Awareness Coordinating Committee. It's 1967. This is against the backdrop of the black power movement. They um, initiate several boycotts and sit-ins. One of them is about the quality of the food in the cafeteria. And they're in the cafeteria. The security asks them to leave. All but 25 leave. And those 25 are tear gassed out. Activism accelerates after that, particularly because in 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King is assassinated. And three black students from South Carolina State College in Orangeburg, which is very close to where Voorhees is located, were killed by police at a demonstration at a segregated bowling alley. Mm -hmm. So activism is accelerating there. And during one sit-in uh, that's considered too disruptive, the governor, now, now remember, I keep moving up, remember, it was, yeah. <laughs> now it's the governor pressures the trustees to fire some faculty, Bernie Dingle, who I'll talk about in a second, to get the institution under control. So the students have a sit-in. The president, whose name was John Potts, did not want to call the National Guard. And he also promised amnesty to the students and said he was going to negotiate with them in terms of their demands. When people hear about black power movement and they think about the demands, what people don't usually realize is what black power demands usually look like at black colleges were like extended library hours, better food, very what we would consider mundane demands, so they weren't outlandish demands. So these are the same kinds of demands that these Voorhees students had. So the president had promised to work with them, promised them amnesty. The governor tells the trustees um, to call the National Guard on the students. Calling a National Guard on a black campus never ends well, because they're all white. The National Guard's persons, men, were all white. Never, it has never ended well. Um, and so the National Guard is called. Students are arrested. Bernie Dingle, uh, who's this professor, um, helped to try and negotiate, like basically talk the students down and keep them safe during this whole affair. He was also the AAUP chapter president. He and four other faculty members are fired. And President Potts, in talking to a colleague, um, was telling the colleague that there were indeed <coughs> pressures against Professor Dingle's continued employment which it might be very difficult to resist. This is that external pressure. There, the, the chairperson of the board, J. Kenneth Morris, who was white, and Bernie Dingle, I think it's fair to say probably hate, they hate each other. At least from what I can read, 
they had very strong feelings, negative feelings about each other. Uh, so in 1969, the uh, United States Senate had a subcommittee about, I think it's riots and disorders and campus disruptions, trying to figure out what's happening on campuses. So it's a U.S. Senate subcommittee. J. Kenneth Morris, the white chairperson of the board, is called to testify. And in his testimony, he focuses on Bernie Dingell. And he says, Dingell has repeatedly called for Morris's resignation and a reconstitution of the board. He has consistently written memos advocating on behalf of faculty and student rights. He protested against calling in the National Guard. He's basically, contumacious conduct, really, could have been another charge. Dingell, there's no love lost there either, he um, demands a full hearing. Remember, he'd been, he'd been fired. There was no hearing. He'd been fired without a hearing. He demands a hearing in front of the full board of trustees. And he also requests that all black trustees be present, which signals the importance of race in the way he understood it on the board of trustees, mm -hmm. like how mm -hmm. this conversation would have gone down. His request went ignored, uh, and he remained um, separated from Voorhees. The class that Professor Paris talked about education for liberation. I taught a long time ago. I have students around who are like, when are you going to teach it again? And I've, told, I've had people say it should be called education for oppression or depression because kind of like the, the story that I told you, this reality is also not necessarily a warm and fuzzy one, but it is, the, it is a reality nonetheless. Um, but how did things change? Why did things change in the South? So AAUP censure meant little if length on the censure list meant anything. Some institutions remained censured for years. One of them was, I think, 23 years. They really couldn't care less about the AUP censure is, is only important for institutions who care about such things. For others, they would see it as actually like a boon, like it, it strengthens my stock when I get censured by the AAUP. So mm -hmm. AUP censure didn't mean a whole heck of a lot. SACS accreditation meant way more because the federal government took cues from these regional accrediting agencies about which institutions should get money. They only gave money to accredited institutions. And philanthropic agencies also did the same. So SACS um, accreditation meant much more than AAUP censure. There's also a series of legal cases. This is an old quote from 1957, but it's one of my favorite quotes from um, a legal decision. Uh, but there are several of these legal decisions that happen over this period of time, the mid-50s through the mid-1970s, that link academic freedom to First Amendment protections. They're not synonymous, but that, that helped to instantiate academic freedom in case law. Uh, other factors that helped change the South included the, the change in the context, right? So in the mid-1950s to the mid-1960s, the mass movement, the, um, the black freedom struggle movement, that mass movement happened in the South. There are battles all over the country, but the mass movement was a Southern movement. What happens in the mid-1960s through the mid-1970s is the black power movement becomes a national, is a national movement, and institutions all over the country are uh, impacted, particularly when they finally start admitting black students themselves in a critical mass. So that's a national phenomena, as is the anti-Vietnam War movement. So my point is that these, it became less regional and more national. So by the middle 1970s, there are no regional differences in why um, faculties and their academic freedom are being violated. It continued to happen, mm. but there weren't regional differences by the middle 1970s because of all of these kinds of factors. So lots of changes, uh, regional shifts as well as uh, national shifts happen. And the way I think about these shifts is in the same way that um, Derek Bell talks about interest convergence and the way that legal scholar uh, Reva Siegel talks about preservation through transformation. Uh, Michelle Alexander also talks about the concept of preservation through transformation in her book, The New Jim Crow, about mass incarceration. And what I mean by that is that Southern public officials, these elected white officials, made changes or allowed changes when and only when they got something out of the compromise. There were minimal changes for maximum benefit. Mm -hmm. So they would admit a couple black students, hire a black faculty member, usually a black staff member, and then eventually a black faculty member. Um, so they wouldn't lose the federal funds. And also, um, it wasn't like 
the feds were some kind of knight in shining armor. They weren't. They shirked their duty left and right and had to be sued themselves to actually enforce the non-desegregation um, mandates of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Uh, so there's these um, marginal changes for maximum benefit. Uh, and I don't, what I don't want you to be left with is that I, um, that I would be dismissing the, the hard work, uh, the carnage that actually happened along mm -hmm. the way with both faculty and students. The reason I'm talking about the changes in this way, like I said, preservation through transformation or um, interest convergence, is to temper any inclination there might be to understand the changes as some kind of moral revelation mm -hmm. on the part of these white Southerners. That's not what it was. They fought this tooth and nail, dragged their feet, and had to be pushed both from the top and from the bottom, and I'm bottom, I'm talking about faculty and students, to make changes. Mm -hmm. So what I hope for the book um, is that it offers some cautions in our contemporary context, not just for the South, but nationwide. There are a whole host of issues that have spurred students and faculty to become activists in the early um, 21st century. Um, some of those issues are old issues, some of them are new, but they continue. And students continue to demand increased decision-making power, uh, control over their non-academic lives, and that their institutions play a much more forceful and present role in um, ameliorating social ills. Faculty continue to battle for their academic freedom, the right to investigate what they want, follow that investigation um, through its natural course. And like I said, with this book, it reminds me that we need to re remain vigilant in the current context. We really do. I think we take these kinds of rights and freedoms for granted, uh, that they will always be around. Tenure is under threat. Academic freedom is under threat. Um, different kinds of money uh, seeds particular kinds of research and not others. So I'm always, my question is, that, if that money's paying for that research, but what isn't getting funded? What questions aren't we asking? So all of these things are still incredibly present. And so those gains in the, made during the middle 20th century, because there were serious gains made in the 20th century, middle 20th century, were dearly bought. And protecting them not only honors the activists of the past, but it ensures that institutions of higher education remain vital and vibrant spaces to sustain democracy. So I'll end there. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> I don't think I need any paper. I'll just <laughs> shout out to my students from Ed Lips 520. I see you around. <laughs> Including Jasmine. All right. Well, um, let's thank Joy one more time for her talk. You laid a lot out for us um, to consider both past and present, right? There's a lot more in the book, too. There is. Exactly. <laughs> um, there's a lot more with respect to thinking about the, the interrelationship among communism, the black freedom struggle, anti-war movement, right? This kind of um, focus on both students and faculty, thinking about public and private, how both public and private are both tied to the federal government, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Which we often, which is a piece I try to raise in my book that we often overlook, right? Um, and so where I want to start with the conversation now is, with since your, your presentation focused more on the faculty member, what you know, so much of the historiography um, on black students at this time, on higher ed, is on, is on black students, right? And so how do you see your book offering us a different story with respect to the changing role of faculty members during this time? And so how, if you could put it in a nutshell, right, uh, what do faculty, both black and white, mean to these particular movements at this time in terms of the black freedom struggle as well as anti-war movements. Because I don't think that's a focus we often take when looking at um, activism you know, during this time period. Yeah. 
So two things. One of the things that I also write about is that I say that students um, are more talked about than faculty, but when it comes to black students, they're talked about as if they weren't students. So that we have a student nonviolent coordinating committee, but nobody talks about them like they were students. You didn't have to be a student to be an activist. You just had right. to be an activist. These were students. And so I really am interested in the institutional context. And so one of my arguments about some of the existing literature on students is that it divorces them from their institutional context. Mm -hmm. Because students were also trying to change their campuses, not just the communities outside. Uh, with regard to faculty, one of the things that I found most interesting is how faculty were defending, um, well, how they were being active and then how they were defending themselves against accusations of them not being active enough. And so you have, you, there are faculty who participated in direct action, so mm -hmm. um, demonstrations and protests. Pretty few and far between, the ones I know of got fired for it. Um, but then there were others, so there's, there's this case at, the, at um, the College of William and Mary, by all accounts a conservative and probably racist institution, not that they always go hand in hand, they don't. Um, where uh, fa uh, students, this was about the anti-Vietnam War movement, they mm -hmm. wanted the faculty to cancel classes. This is going to happen here. It's already happened here. It's going to continue to happen here, right? And every other institution where students are active and they want faculty to cancel classes. And there was one faculty member who said, I'm not canceling class. This is my, I'm exercising my academic freedom I fought for, mm -hmm. and I'm going to be teaching about fascism in France. You know, and so I'm, I'm going to be using my academic freedom to teach students about um, threats to democracy during a time of war. Mm -hmm. And so it's just interesting to see the different ways that faculty intersected with the anti-Vietnam War mm -hmm. movement or the black freedom struggle. Um, the way I think about it is that, and I've often told students this when I've when I've had students ask me about you know, activism, or it's often students of color in graduate school saying, am I selling out? I feel like I need to be out doing something. My question is always, do you believe W.E.B. Du Bois was the Banks started here in 1969, mm -hmm. right? So same time period as your book. And when we think about the history of multicultural education in our field, right, how then do you think about kind of the, the relationship between the ways in which faculty then were pushing against the grain and what that means today to still push against the grain when academic freedom is still under threat, when particular research questions are not being funded? Right? What does that mean today in our pursuit of educational justice? So I think um, faculty pursuing research agendas aligned with justice work can feel marginalized, um, underappreciated, underfunded <laughs> um, in a lot of ways, and alone in a mm. lot of ways. But when I think back to 1969, that was alone. That was like extra alone. Uh, and so what I think we have to remember is I stand on his shoulders. I'm here. I'm literally here. I mean, part of the reason I'm actually at the University of Washington is because of James Banks. Right. Joe Lott, too. Dr. Lott over there. We stand on his shoulders. It's our job now to provide the same bedrock for other students because I think that if we can see the work as, uh, as joined and part of a longer um, history as well as a wider body. Mm -hmm. So if I'm not just thinking of myself solely as a historian, mm -hmm. that makes you less lonely, it makes you feel more appreciated, it may perhaps more opportunities for grants. There are all kinds of ways to build community that can further research towards educational justice. So <clears throat> with that being said, how do we then think about the role of history, educational history, and we are the smallest division, <laughs> In yeah, ARA. Yeah, they tried to demote us to a special interest group. I said, I wish you would try to turn history into a special interest group. What is that? So we are, yeah, you know, so we're, we're this little nugget in this big educational research world. Mm -hmm. But yet, 
I think many people who are committed to educational justice and educational liberation have an appreciation for history, especially the history that speaks to the ways in which schools and universities have oppressed, right, and have these operations in which they are beholden to particular entities and, and they, they'll act on those but not necessarily in the name of liberation but when it's to their benefit, right? Mm -hmm. So if you could say something with respect to then what is the role of the ed historian in the 21st century? You know, I think for me, um, and like I said, it's deja vu all over again. People think they keep reinventing the wheel. If you'd asked me if that policy would work, I could have told you it didn't work before, because I know it happened before, because I've studied it. Um, and I also think, so that one is just knowledge of history. But I also think what historians bring is uh, a deep appreciation for context. Yep. Uh, and so we're not going to be able to offer a silver bullet, which none of us can, by the way, to fix education. Um, but what we can offer are helping you figure out the right questions to ask, understanding the, the, the way that this one policy initiative is actually going to have a differential impact on different communities. We can help you situate whatever it is, the curricular innovation, the policy innovation, uh, innovation in a wider context so that it probably has a better chance of um, succeeding. And we can also, I think, um, bring it down a notch because I think people really are searching for the silver bullet. And as a historian, I see it as a pursuit rather than an end goal. And I also understand mm -hmm. it as shifting. So we can bring the anxiety down a notch <laughs> for people, again, by putting it in a context, whether it's its contemporary context or its historical context. It's about um, one of the things that Nancy Beattie and Debbie Kurdeman and I were in Social and Cultural Foundations. Uh, and I was talking about this in my Education as a Moral Endeavor class, um, I don't know, maybe it was just this last Monday, is that sometimes it's not debates between good and bad, sometimes it's debate between two goods. So what are the value tensions at play? Mm -hmm. Historians have a unique role to he in helping to identify those value tensions that exist, to help parse them out so that decision making flows from um, a healthy and more authentic place. Mm -hmm. So if anybody looking for somebody on a grant, I'm happy to help. <laughs> right. So, and that was, that was actually going to be my next question to you, right? So because historians are, yeah. I mean, it's kind of unusual to have two senior historians and even today in, in one college of education, right, to have you and Nancy both here. That's just our field seems, people don't seem to have an appreciation as much for what historians bring to the table, right? We're no longer required in teacher education programs. We have topics you know, and tensions. Right. But I'm just saying, across yeah. the board, we're not being as required as much in yeah. teacher oh, ed totally. programs. Oh, totally. Yes, right? definitely. So then what's your kind of charge to us as historians? I think we could take a cue from journalists and shortening our stories. <laughs> I think we got a lot of words. I do. I'm serious. This is like practical, practical advice. Because when you talk about context, that takes a while. But it's necessary, right? But I do think that um, distilling our mess, I mean, this is like <laughs> literally practical advice, distilling our message mm -hmm. can be helpful. Cre write a white paper, you know, or uh, I mean, I have plenty of colleagues that I talk to all the time. I, we could talk much more about how we can inform each other's work and then it infill so it's not just me having to do that labor mm -hmm. because I don't think that historian that there's all of a sudden going to be a boon and everybody's going to be like oh my god this is what I've been missing all my life <laughs> is I need three historians of education that's not going to happen but what we need to do is create allies as well as people who know and understand mm -hmm. so that they can also be resources all right definitely so that's another way I would think about it okay yeah yeah so <laughs> oh so um so, like I said, so I, I've read Michelle. I just want to. So Michelle and I do um, different work, but similar work. I look on. I look at higher education. That's been my focus. She's looking at um, K through 12. But so I, what I, so I have, you know, I've under, I have ideas about teacher education, and you might have some ideas too, mm -hmm. and about the role of faculty uh, in um, in an, in the academy and in a in a educational justice movement. But I. I don't know, I guess I'm curious to hear your, since we're in dialogue. Right. 
This is why I was saying, Stuart, you asked me a question. I think you already have the answer. <laughs> so I'm just curious to know from your vantage point with the work that you've done on private white institutions uh, or the private white schools in, um, at, is it Atlanta? Mm -hmm. In Atlanta, mm -hmm. in the round in de during desegregation, mm -hmm. how your own work informs how you might think about the role of history um, in a school of education or, or in an educational justice movement. Right. I think that... Um, I think that a every institution has to know its past, and I think some institutions are timid to reckon with their past. Right? We're we're quick to say these are the gains, these are the strides, but to actually wrestle with how and why those decisions were made, how and yeah. why you you know might have aligned with the notion of interest convergence or your institution did or your institutional decision makers did, I think is um, important for every institution, especially those who are touting themselves as the most inclusive and diverse, right, that there are, right? And so a lot of elite private schools, both at the K through 12 level and at the higher ed level, right, say we are all about diversity and inclusion. <laughs> so. You know, how did you become diverse and inclusive, or right? Are you? Or are you well, diverse and inclusive? And what do those words mean? Yeah. Exactly. So I think the historian can help those institutions and the people who have been a part of those institutions, right, understand that history. And actually, I mean, put names and faces to these first. I mean, there are people going to all these different institutions who have no idea who the first black professor was to get tenure at their institution, right? Or who or was the first- Or how recent it was. Or how recent it was, right? Or who was the first indigenous person, or whatever. We don't have, we don't speak in those ways. You know, our institutions don't speak in those ways. So I think historians can help with that. And I think in terms of a education, I think I agree, completely agree with you in terms of allies, right? In terms of if we're gonna be about educational justice, education for liberation, we have to find allies across the spectrum of educational research and even outside of educational yeah. research with those scholars and those teachers, right, who are prepared to take on that fight. Because whether whether we believe it or not, I think we get into our own little world, so we get our, into our own little ed justice worlds, right? We forget we are actually on the margins. <laughs> and so I think we have to be willing to cross those disciplinary boundaries and have those conversations and get on those grants with each other and, and to do that work. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. All right, let's get this done. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Thank so really thank you both for, for this uh, wonderful dialogue. Um, at this point, um, what we're going to do is we're actually gonna, just going to transition into some book signing and have the dialogue part and some questions and stuff over there while, uh, while Dr. Williamson Law and Dr. Purdy um, sign books. If that sounds may okay. I inter may, I inter oh, may I interject? Please. This probably isn't even up. Yes. What is your thoughts on the role of history <laughs> in educational justice? She didn't tell me this. We're, yeah, we're not live streaming anymore. <laughs> uh, so, so for me, um, you know, one of the things that that um, you know, if we if we don't understand the way um, that we have fought over time, and that this is a trajectory, that yeah. the struggle for for liberation, for justice you know, for, you know, sovereignty of Native people um, and resurgence, um, uh, for the rights of, of, of LGBTQ people, mm -hmm. right? And we're thinking a lot of our trans um, and, and gender yep. non-binary uh, yep. folks uh, and communities right now um, in terms of migration, in terms of land, in terms of ableism. If we don't understand the trajectory of that, um, then we can't really be about it right now, and we certainly can't imagine the otherwise. It's really hard to imagine otherwise if we're not rooted mm -hmm. in where we've been. And so I just thank you both for kind of helping me see that in education. And I'm so grateful to have two educational historians in my college, right? <laughs> and, uh, and I actually think there should be three in every college. <laughs> and so there is going to be a boon. Um, uh, uh, maybe, we can have, maybe we can have one or two questions. It, sounds, it seems like people, you know, one or two questions. Yes. And as long as they're very, very brief good. questions. Don't worry. Hi, and thank you for your wonderful talks, both of you. 
Uh, my name is Marisol Berrios Miranda, and I teach a class, uh, American Sabor, Latinos and Latinas in U.S. Popular Music. And the, t the theme of race and inclusion is very pre present in my class. That's a little background, but my question is, as historians, how the tenets of Paulo Freire mm -hmm. inform your research or not? Um, I wouldn't, I, I teach about Paulo Freire. I don't know if I would, I've never thought about myself as enacting anybody else's particular theory. Um, one of the things that my students in a couple of weeks will find out is that the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which I teach a lot about and study about, uh, predated Paulo Freire. Mm -hmm. And so I caution that, well, him being, um, the pedagogy of the oppressed being translated into English. And so I caution them about using Freire as a, as a ruler to make sense of another organization. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the same way that I think about my own self and work is that, um, I have I've constructed my own identity out of people that I trust and uh, and admire, but not necessarily following a particular theoretical lens or model. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you for that answer. I think we'll we'll cut it now so that people can eat a little bit more and then also mm -hmm. um, have dialogue as as these two wonderful scholars and authors um, sign. But we do have something to offer you, um, and so. Oh. Aww. Oh, just, how uh, cool just, is that? A, yeah, just oh, as a, wow. uh, a memory of this uh, special inaugural event. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Django. I love that. So thank you both again. Thanks everybody for tuning in and um, buy some books and talk to these wonderful and brilliant scholars. Thank you. Thank you, Django.